when you think about muscle, it's the primary site for glucose disposal. So if you care about your metabolism, you have to care about muscle. If you care about fatty acid metabolism, if you care about cholesterol, you have to care about muscle. So if we look at the big killers, we have obesity, we have hypertension, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease. What if I told you these are diseases of skeletal muscle first? First thing I want to ask you about is something you call muscle-centric medicine. Yeah. Can you talk about what that means? Yeah, of course. So muscle-centric medicine is the concept that muscle is the largest organ in the body, mm -hmm. and it's actually an endocrine organ. Mm -hmm. So if we take a step back, everything focuses on obesity right now. Yeah. We are overweight. It is all about losing weight. All our metabolic markers are really focused on being over fat. But what if I told you that that's actually a mistake? We are not over fat, we are under muscled. And if we really care about people and we really care about weight, we have to be muscle centric. Mm -hmm. So this concept that muscle is the largest organ in the body is what muscle centric medicine is all about. You know, there's a saying, a running saying that it's a skin you know, that's right, the it's wrong. Organ. That's yeah, wrong. It's muscle. What is it like? Yep. 30, 40%? Yeah. Of course, depending on if you are a bigger human and training, but yeah. yeah. And it's really interesting because skeletal muscle, people always think about skeletal muscle as looking good in a bikini or as it relates to locomotion, but actually it is an endocrine organ. Yeah. And it's really underrepresented in healthcare. So if that is the case, which of course it is, it is. How does this? play into some of our biggest issues that we're struggling with right now. For example, as you mentioned, we're targeting and looking at adiposity right. when it comes to issues like type 2 diabetes. Right. How can muscle and the care of mm -hmm. influence issues like that? Well, when you think about muscle, it's the primary site for glucose disposal. So if you care mm -hmm. about your metabolism, you have to care about muscle. If you care about fatty acid metabolism, if you care about cholesterol, you have to care about muscle. So if we look at the big killers or the big burdens on our society, mm -hmm. we have obesity, we have hypertension, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease. What if I told you these are diseases of skeletal muscle first? And that obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cardiovascular disease begin in skeletal muscle first. Insulin resistance begins in skeletal muscle first. And if we care about root cause medicine, then we have to care about skeletal muscle. Now, this is very counterculture it right is. now. And so that's why we're so bad at treating it. Yeah. We're we're trying to answer the wrong question. We're trying to fix for adiposity. Adiposity is a symptom. It's a symptom of impaired muscle. Before we talk about how exactly muscle plays into these conditions, including, yeah. as you mentioned, Alzheimer's, I'm very, yeah. very curious and excited to talk about that. Let's talk about this being counterculture because your conventional training as well. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your background yeah. and how you got to this place. Yeah. Um, so I've had a very interesting background when it comes to health and nutrition. I graduated high school early and moved in with my godmother, whose name is Liz Lipsky. Do you know Liz Lipsky? She wrote Digestive that, Wellness. That sounds very <laughs> familiar. Yes. I think she even wrote a, a um, children's book. And a, and a quote on somebody else's book, like one of my friends potentially. Okay. She is an OG in functional medicine. Yes. Um, and she was a PhD at the time and I moved in with her and worked for room and board. And I started really learning about the role of nutrition in health and disease. And at 17, that changed the trajectory of everything I did. Mm. Then when I went to go do my undergraduate, I did it in human nutrition, vitamin, mineral metabolism. And I was lucky enough to train under one of the world leading experts in protein metabolism, still to this day, 20 years later. Mm. And then of course, medical school, almost quit at least three times, it was terrible. Um, then I did two years of psychiatry training, three years of family medicine, and then I went back to Wash U, which I know you're from St. Louis. That's right, yeah. And out. I did a combined clinical research fellowship with medical practice, so it was, um, nutritional sciences, geriatrics, and obesity medicine. Wow, that is such a diverse 
And but each step along the way, there's it's all intertwined. Yeah, that and, is and so actually, fascinating. I would love to share with you where muscle centric medicine was born from. Yeah, please. Okay, so after going through nutritional science training, medical school, working with Dr. Donald Lehman, going through residency, then landing at WashU and doing a combined fellowship in geriatrics, obesity medicine, and nutrition, I was working on a study where we were looking at body weight and brain brain function. And I became very attached to one of the participants. She was a mom of three. She really had struggled with her weight her whole life. And you know, you spend a lot of time with these people. And I imaged her brain. And when we looked at the MRI study, it was almost as if it was looking at the brain of, of an Alzheimer's patient. And I realized that at that time, in 10 years, this woman was going to actually struggle to remember names. Hmm. It was at that moment, I realized that we had been focused on the wrong stuff. That this is a woman who had been chasing, losing weight her whole life, and we were focused on the wrong tissue. Hmm. We were focused on adipose tissue for her when we should have been focused on muscle. Because muscle, as the metabolic driver, as the way in which you can manage metabolism, would have helped prevent the Alzheimer's that I was looking at for her. And that's where actually muscle-centric medicine was born. It was from an entirely devastating desire to fix the problem and then a realization that we were trying to fix the wrong problem. That's powerful. Now, as you're talking, it already, like the... The pieces are coming together yeah. for me and seeing, because I think we tend to also have very uh, compartmentalized ways of looking at things in modern medicine. We do. And you're really bringing this together. You know, even the brain, it's not considered to be a muscle per se, but it functions sort of like a muscle in its development, like certain things getting exercise and used yeah. and being able to develop and grow in plasticity. But obviously muscle is going to affect the activity of our brain. Right, Let's talk does. about that a little bit more. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Skeletal muscle, when you contract skeletal muscle, it releases myokines. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this concept that skeletal muscle is actually an organ system is, it is true, it's relatively new science. Some of the, the better data is coming out since 2012. So this is new stuff. Pedersen really kind of paved the way. And when you think about exercise, we often think about endorphins. But we don't think about contracting muscle releasing myokines. And one of those myokines, and there's many, there's hundreds of different myokines. BDNF is a myokine. Yeah. Mm. And it goes to the brain and it affects brain function. It also affects nutrients. It affects lipolysis. It affects the liver. It affects all these other tissues. Skeletal muscle as an organ also has a relationship to the immune system. It's essentially a crosstalk. And if we care about Alzheimer's, which we do, and we care about cardiovascular disease, and we care about type 2 diabetes, and we care about insulin resistance, we have to understand that at the very core, we have to fix skeletal muscle first. And what I'm seeing is it's becoming more and more challenging. And the reason it's becoming more and more challenging is because there's narratives of misinformation of nutrition. And of course, this is just one aspect. But these narratives make it very hard for people to age well because dietary protein is so controversial. Mm, right. And it shouldn't be. It wasn't, well, was it controversial 10 years ago when you were looking at it? It wasn't. Yeah. It's so funny how these things like right. come in and out of favor. Right. You know, the same thing happened with fat. Right. There's a big fat phobia for a long time. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, this issue with protein, this plant versus animal based protein issue and then these myths around protein like it being bad for the bones and promoting cancer and bad for the environment kidneys too kidneys, kidneys. Yeah. they just came out with a few there was a recent meta-analysis to prove that totally wrong Stu phillips uh wrote a great meta-analysis regarding kidney function but if you looked at the common media you wouldn't believe those things you would believe that all our problems relate to eating protein. Right. This is what I really admire about you is that, and you know this, 
so many of our friends and colleagues have come from conditions where they're wanting to help people in medicine, but literally just they're working in volume right. and not even really having time to read medical literature, but on top of that, actually understanding it yeah. and understanding where it came from mm -hmm. as well. You have to understand where it came from. Yeah. You have to understand the backstory behind things. You know, um, it's interesting when I post about red meat or I talk about red meat. And listen, do I really care about red meat? No, I care about protecting individuals as they age. I care about the trajectory of aging. Mm -hmm. Skeletal muscle health is the key to aging well. It is the organ of longevity. You have to get that right if you want to protect yourself and your family members. That's you got it. you got to get that right and with the current information people aren't going to get it right with this said there's something i want to just circle back to really quickly because yeah. you mentioned this myokine activity yep. through muscle activation yes. and the potentiality here the influence on the immune system yep. and the anti-inflammatory capacity yep. and i want to tie this in with there is a big issue on a lot of people's minds right now you know we're talking about obviously chronic disease at epidemic proportions right now, but also right. also infectious diseases. Yes. And the biggest risk factor outside of mm -hmm. advanced age is obesity, right. reported by the CDC. Massive meta-analysis, 540,000 patients, yeah. and obesity is the number one risk factor. But what I'm hearing is it's not just about targeting fat. It's the wrong, it's the wrong focus, yeah. actually. So let's talk about mm -hmm. how muscle development is critical in yes. solving this issue and in supporting our immune system. Absolutely. I love that you bring that up. And I want to just point out one thing in terms of how broken the system is. Okay. When you look at obesity and you go to the doctor, you look at obesity endpoints. You look at insulin, you look at glucose, you look at triglycerides, you look at cholesterol, you look at uh, CRP, you look at these endpoints that are all related to obesity. Okay, great. And everybody does that. That makes sense. This is what we do. What about endpoints related to muscle health? We don't look at that. We don't look at what is actually released post-exercise and if we are effectively stimulating the myokines. Or we don't look at end pro, you know, marker endpoints post-exercise. This is a huge gape. Right? This is a, there's like a gaping hole. I also want to bring up something else. We know what percent body fat could negatively affect people. We have an idea, right? If you're 30% or above, that might be negative. I can't tell you what your percent muscle mass should be. We have no idea. Mm -hmm. This is how little data that we have for actually solution-oriented medicine. This blows my mind. Why are we not looking at skeletal muscle as a you know, marker endpoint for health and vitality? Even a DEXA looks at body fat and then it extrapolates lean tissue. I mean, these are big holes but that's and, like all. But everybody, but no, but there lean hasn't tissue. been, right, all lean tissue. We're looking at bone, blood, we're looking at everything. Right. But how is it that we've, we've had like blinders on, constantly focused on obesity? And if we really care about solution and we really care about getting people better, we have to shift to skeletal muscle. And it's not about just going to work out. It's about understanding that as we age, skeletal muscle changes. Mm -hmm. Skeletal muscle is the primary site for glucose disposal. Right. It is the primary site for metabolic regulation. It is a primary site for fatty acid oxidation. If you want to survive an infectious disease and your body goes into a highly catabolic state, what is going to save you? It's going to be skeletal muscle. That is so not part of the conversation. But everyone, but it's all about fat. Yeah. That's wrong. And in fact, insulin resistance begins in skeletal muscle first before you gain weight, before you see elevated blood glucose. It is all about skeletal muscle. The myokines, and again, this is a newer science, and I'm just starting to look at this data in my clinic. We're just starting to collect some of this information. Myokines, when skeletal muscle contracts, it has this interface between all organ systems just like hormones. And it's fascinating. 
And if we can shift the focus to a more muscle-centric based medicine model, then we can move the needle. Mm. There's so many, I love that you brought this up and I think that this is part of your, your legacy it's my is, job. You yeah. know, we taught, you know, before the camera's rolling, I, I asked you, do you like podcasting? Or I said, do you love it? And you go, well, love is not a strong enough word. I have to do it. This message of muscle-centric medicine and intelligent health is my purpose. Mm. I've been trained by some of the world-leading experts. How did I just land in that lab? It doesn't just happen. And it's a personal responsibility to do it. You know, this reminds me of going in when I was a kid and, you know, do all these checkups. You right. go in to see your doctor. They take your weight. They, you know, take your temperature, all these different things. But there isn't an assessment for muscle. No. Strength. And also as we age. So what also happens as, and I know, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, but I am so excited to be able to talk about this and I want to make sure we can get this out. When we age, the health of skeletal muscle isn't just about the size of the muscle or the strength. Aging skeletal muscle can look like marbled steak. And if you believe that skeletal muscle is the organ of longevity and you believe it's responsible for metabolic regulation, glucose regulation, brain health, right? You have to have metabolic control. When tissue becomes marbled like a marbled steak, which is exactly what happens it becomes less efficient. It becomes not as metabolically robust. Mm. So this is reminding me, of course, like that is, it, there's a change happening in that ratio. We have more intramuscular fat we do. starting to become more dominant. We do. And I, I want you to talk about this. This is so important. You know, sarcopenia, there's yeah. this blanket term, but what's happening once we get to a certain spot. Wait, do you believe that though? No, I don't. Is... <laughs> I don't believe that all of a sudden you turn fifty or sixty yeah. and you have sarcopenia. Sarcopenia, I believe, starts in your thirties. Yeah, come on. This is what I was trying. To, I was trying to frame it. Yes, because <laughs> yes. when you image individuals, whether you're doing an MRI or CT, you see fat infiltration into their muscle. That's not normal. We've become domesticated. Yes. Yeah. And then now you're also fighting this anti-animal narrative, this anti-protein narrative, and you're trying to focus on skeletal muscle health. It's a losing battle. You understand? And then all this stuff about longevity is coming out and people are saying you should reduce your protein intake. That is the single worst piece of advice I would ever give an aging individual. Not to mention, I worked in a nursing home for two years. I'm a trained geriatrician. This is my area of specialty. I did this at Wash U, which is not, uh, you know, not a joke. It's yeah. a tough place to do it. Yeah. Not one of those individuals would say we should reduce our protein intake mm -hmm. because it's going to affect, affect longevity. Yeah. What longevity? What? So from does that mean six months? Does that mean one year? Is that the difference between living between ninety five and ninety six? Crippled in bed and bedridden, or robust and out moving at ninety five? The framework at which people are thinking about these things are extremely narrow minded. Yeah. The thing that surprised me the most. In, in recent years, yeah. as I've, you know, this is my life, studying food, studying nutrition, and of course teaching. Yeah. And I was just, I'm continuously shocked at how important protein is right. and also how it's vilified. And one of the studies that I actually cited in my latest book, Eat Smarter, was a really well done meta-analysis looking at the protein requirements as we age yes. being even more significant yes. Yes, and seeing is. higher rates of disease when, yep. po when folks are losing muscle. and But also they noted that this is something that you can do something about. Which That's is so thing. amazing, which is why this isn't some nebulous cause. And I, you know, one of the studies that you may be referring to is called the ProAge study. Mm -hmm. And it was the new recommendation for protein requirements as we age. The RDA is set at 0.8 grams per kilogram. We know anything below that is dangerous for people. I mean, that, the average, according to NHANES data, the average female is consuming 70 grams of protein. Not to mention, people will say, oh, but that's so much. Where are they coming up with that? Why, where, you, we have to question what we've been taught. Yeah. 
Protage, the Protage study, we know that as people age, you need roughly double the amount of protein. And there's a normal physiologic process as we age called anabolic resistance. And this, it's this concept that the skeletal muscle becomes less efficient at utilizing protein. You must account for that as we age. Not only that, but you also can see that in obesity. This, is, again, I, man, I'm so grateful to have you here because this is bringing, I love why, ask, answering the question why, why is the requirement higher as we age, as the study indicates, this anabolic resistance yeah. is the why, it's the thing behind yep. the scenes. And so again, this is something we can do something about, right. but we have to reframe things and also support people on getting in the good stuff. Yeah. Now, this isn't a debate about plant versus animal. I'm a, I'm really somebody who is always thinking about what humans have been doing the longest. You know, what do our genes expect us to right. consume? And based on that, and based on what we're eating today, we are actually, as a society, con as a society contrary to popular belief, we are largely plant based because we are 70%, of all the actually, processed food. Seventy percent. Our, our diet is currently 70% plant-based. And I am not against plant-based proteins. This is not, like you said, it's not a conversation of plant versus animal. What it is a conversation of is it's about misinformation mm -hmm. and how deadly that misinformation becomes. What happens as we age, the window to actually affect change gets smaller and smaller. And that's where it becomes so significant. When you're in your 20s and 30s, we can all argue. When you hit 40, you better know what you are doing and you better know what you're doing for that next decade because clock, the clock is not going back. And when you were young, you could be on the Twinkie diet and be fine. And when you were young, you can get away with less dietary protein as long as you're training hard. And listen, if you wanna counteract sarcopenia, you train hard but you have to eat high quality protein. And if you're not, you better be supplementing in a very smart way. All right, let's talk about this. So <laughs> what is the amount we yeah. ideally are targeting? Again, you are really foremost expert on this subject matter. And also, so within that, so we've got how, what, how much should we be targeting? Yeah. And where are we actually going to be ideally getting this from mm -hmm. because of the quality as right. well really important stuff you know for my recommendation is a bit on the higher end and that's one gram per pound ideal body weight individuals don't have to go that high so if you are how much do you weigh uh, 175 -ish. okay you could easily eat 175 grams of protein be great you could also eat 150 grams of protein and also be great so what i'm saying is there is some flexibility but we have to think about dietary protein, not just in a 24 hour period. We have to think about it in a meal based experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to explain to you why. So one gram per pound ideal body weight is perfectly fine. What we have to think about is you want to really leverage protein as a signaling mechanism for skeletal muscle. And the way that you do that is you get branch chain amino acids. Mm -hmm. And that is typically 30 to 50 grams of high quality protein with two and a half to three grams of leucine, which is really that, that target, kind of that key, will then stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, what would that be? Four or five ounces of rough yeah five ounces of steak five ounces of chicken will be enough to then stimulate muscle protein synthesis when you are younger you can get away with less uh, you know my daughter is two and a half she could eat five grams of protein and it will stimulate her muscles for anybody else you know as people age you actually require a bolus amount so you need that eaten at one time to actually signal the muscle. And that becomes really important to understand. So 30 to 50 grams per meal to really optimize that stimulus is necessary. So if you sip on a protein shake, you'll never get to that leucine threshold in the blood. You won't stimulate your muscle. You do that over a period of time, you become sarcopenic. 
And obviously I'm making this a bit black and white and I, I don't mean to do that, but for the listener to really understand, they must understand that we have to rethink the way that we're feeding. We have to rethink how we're eating. And the way in which we do that is we really focus, you prioritize protein, you do things in a protein forward manner. And you do that, if you're interested in metabolic correction, you could do that three times a day. If you are wanting to combat sarcopenia, you need to make sure that the first meal is optimized and that last meal is optimized. So that, and I don't care when that first meal is. Mm -hmm. That first meal when you are in a catabolic state should be between 40 and 50 grams. This will help overcome anabolic resistance in the muscle. I want to share this with you. <laughs> what I've seen to be, and this is just from my clinical experience, I've yeah. worked with so many folks over the years. Contrary to popular belief, the number one thing that I would see, as far as, of course, like helping folks to eat more real food, right. of course, that's the primary pillar. But within that, if we're talking about macronutrients, mm -hmm. it's not a low carb or a low fat or anything. I'm really looking at getting the right amount of protein in for these yeah. folks. If we're talking specifically about weight loss, there's nothing that I've seen to be as effective. I and agree. it's just like again and again and again. But you said the ideal body weight, one gram per ideal body weight. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is, for example, they're 150 pounds yep. and they're wanting to be 130 pounds then and they, they lose 20 pounds. Yep. I would have them eat 130 grams of protein. And then they would also make sure that they're getting it between 30 and 50 grams per meal. And okay. that's how they would break it out. And so also chances are they're probably eating half of that right now. Right. And what happens metabolically when we are increasing our protein? How is that actually changing our body? You know, it's interesting. Protein is very unique and it's complex. There's 20 amino acids. We have nine essential amino acids. When you eat protein, there's this thermic effect of food. What that means is it actually takes energy to utilize that protein. The common belief is that it's to deal with the nitrogen and the urea, but that's actually not what myself and some of my colleagues believe to be true. I was talking to Donna Lehman about this this morning. And really, the thermic effect of feeding, it actually relates to muscle protein synthesis, and it actually relates to mTOR. That process is metabolically um, challenging. It utilizes a lot of ATP. That is where I believe the thermic effect of feeding or the thermic effect of food comes in. And it really comes from the muscle utilization mm. of that high quality protein versus fat and carbohydrates are, you know, maybe fat is 3% and maybe carbs are between five and, yeah, you know, maybe 5%, maybe it's a little higher. So this idea that you eat 100 calories of steak and if the thermic effect of food is, I don't know, 20%, then you only get 80 calories because your body's utilizing the other 20 to deal with the amino acids. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. The other thing is that it protects skeletal muscle. We care about skeletal muscle because we care about metabolism and glucose regulation, right? Yeah. Also, it signals satiety mechanisms. You are much less likely to overeat. And this is interesting, some of the breakfast skipping studies, this is out of Heather Leidy's lab, and they looked at kids, you know, young girls, and brain studies where they fed them high protein in the morning and they looked at their brain and they were much less driven to eat cupcakes or other foods, other yeah. sweet foods. Yeah, I believe it was um, Kansas yeah. University. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, right. I know, right? And I, <laughs> I saw that. So, and I, because I remember it because I was so happy when I saw that they're actually looking at the brain. Right. Right. They're actually getting in there. Let's see what happens. Let's actually see when we're talking about this increase in satiety hormones and this shift in metabolism, what's actually happening, happening in the brain, which is largely controlling so much of this mm -hmm. process. So that's fascinating. So we've, we, got, we got this benefit with satiety. And you also mentioned mTOR. Now, this is a controversial thing Can't as wait. well. Yeah. Let's talk let's, about let's, that. By the time people leave this podcast or are done listening to this, I want them to not have any question. I want them to understand some fundamental concepts that they can take home and just go, okay. 
mTOR, cancer and protein has gotten a lot of heat. Have you heard that? I mean, that's the big thing with this mTOR situation. And can you talk, say what mTOR is? Yeah. Or... mTOR is mechanistic target of rapamycin. It's in every cell. It's in skeletal muscle. It's in the pancreas. It's in the brain. It's in the liver. Every cell. And it's a nutrient sensing mechanism. In skeletal muscle, mTOR is exquisitely sensitive to leucine, which is once you trigger mTOR, it goes down this pathway, you know, and I'm oversimplifying it, and you get muscle protein synthesis. When you stimulate mTOR in the liver, which could be from excess calories or excess insulin or excess carbohydrates, this is a whole other pathway, okay? The idea that, and there's other ways to stimulate mTOR, by the way, which is exercise. Um, so there are other ways. This idea that protein and cancer, that there's some correlation, is, there's actually zero evidence to support that. And I'm going to start with the concept of the, some of the studies. And when you think about lung cancer, or smoking and cancer, the risk ratio is 12, which means there is a high clinical association. Anything above two is considered a risk. They looked at the data for protein and cancer, red meat consumption and cancer, and came out to be 1.1, 1.3. So I ask you, if the data doesn't support that there is a connection, then why is there such a huge driver? So let's go back to the argument of protein and cancer, specifically as it relates to mTOR. When you eat protein, you do stimulate mTOR. Again, mTOR is in every tissue. mTOR is exquisitely sensitive to amino acids in muscle. It doesn't mean that mTOR is exquisitely sensitive to amino acids in the liver because it's more sensitive to other things like excess carbohydrates or excess calories, excess energy. The concept that protein would then cause cancer, we have to, number one, think about, well, what kind of cancer are we talking about? Cancer is a disease of the genome. Are we talking about lung cancer? Are we talking about colon cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer? Those cancers are clearly linked to obesity as a risk factor. Whereas if you're telling me you eat protein and protein upregulates a pathway, since when does upregulating a pathway cause a genomic alteration? Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So the argument is, well, if you eat protein, you're going to get cancer. Okay, what's the mechanism of action? You're saying it's mTOR, but the idea that you're pushing a pathway up, that you're pushing mTOR up, has nothing to do with a genetic alteration. They're two separate things. Protein isn't a uh, initiator of cancer. mTOR is a growth, it's a growth complex. Do you see, it's, it doesn't make any sense. So there's some other reason why people are perpetuating this narrative. So for example, like when we're younger, we tend to have a lot of mTOR. So wouldn't everybody growth. get cancer then? <laughs> it's, I mean, know? it's normal. So mTOR is a normal, it has normal mechanisms in the body. It's not a bad thing. That's like saying going out to exercise is bad because it stimulates mTOR. What? If you really care about mTOR, then you shouldn't be eating excess carbohydrates. You shouldn't be eating excess calories and you shouldn't be snacking all day because all of those things stimulate mTOR. And if you really care about cancer, then you really have to care about obesity. Hmm. This cannot be a topic of protein. Yeah, I'm just thinking about it's a logical fallacy because with mTOR being more robust, especially we'll just say when we're in our early 20s, for example, wouldn't that be so cancer promoting if just just to be 20 years old? Yeah, yeah, no, it sounds know, like what the they talk level. about with the IGF-1. They say, oh, yeah. well, grow, you know, growth hormone is so high when you're younger. Well, if, if that was really related to cancer, you, have, you know, when we think about cancer, you have to think there has to be some genetic mutation that happens. If cancer is a disease of the genome. And these become very, very important questions. So if you look at 
you know, they, they had a, a recent uh, group of studies, the Annals of Internal Medicine came out with these group of studies where they put protein and red meat to the test. It's called the, um, they use the grade system. And they wanted to see, okay, so should we really be cutting back on protein, by the way, or red meat? By the way, red meat consumption since 1975 is down 40% down 40 percent but somehow we're making it all the problem we're 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 far less healthy <laughs> since then but we're eating less red meat uh chicken consumption has taken its place it doesn't the narratives don't make sense and i think that we really have to come to question some of these narratives so the grade study or not the grade study this um group of studies from annals of internal medicine was about it was a bunch of different papers actually determined that there's no reason for us to be cutting back on red meat I am telling you, they came after this guy. They came after the head researcher to cut, to try to get him thrown out. It, but it's science. So yeah. since when? Since when does that happen in the history of ever? There's there's a lot of problems and a lot of issues with the things that we're seeing. So oh, wow. this is a major problem. Yeah, this is a serious, serious issue. So then if you go and you look at this IR committee, this IR committee is that they determine what is carcinogenic or not. And they get together a group of papers, okay? And they, this this guy named um, Klerfeld, I can't remember his first name, David Klerfeld was on the committee when they came out saying red meat was a carcinogen. Remember that whole thing? Um and he said, listen, they threw out all the randomized controlled trials because they were smaller. They used epidemiology data. They used observational data, which is really low quality data yeah. to say that protein, that their protein causes cancer, to, to list it as a carcinogen. The majority of people were vegan or vegetarian on that board. Yeah. We've got to take that into consideration, of course, you know, who's putting the research together. And again, everybody, it's not saying that these are bad people. They're no, not at all. But it's the, Absolutely it's the not agenda. At all. And also, like, we cannot just cherry pick which data is convenient and Correct. throw out. This has been one of my biggest Correct. things I've been driving towards this past year and a half, two yeah. years, is for folks to understand the quality of data. Like, if we've got a right. double blind, randomized, placebo controlled trial, trial demonstrating this outcome, the gold standard. and then yeah. we throw that to the side. Right. Because it or doesn't throw doesn't twenty fit. of those to the side because it doesn't fit the narrative, and then we point to some observational data. Right, it's a problem. That's not okay. Not only that, but that's how we train our professionals. That's brutal. Yeah. So it's perpetuating. It the perpetuates cycle of it, ignorance. and because just because an individual is a physician doesn't mean that they are looking at the science. They are taking someone's word for it, and at some level, you have to. But at the other, you really should go back and say, man, okay, does this make sense? Does this, this make sense? The recommendation that I'm giving, is it actually making sense? This, this idea that um, red meat is a carcinogen, how? That concept of TMAO, if you care about TMAO, then there's more TMAO in fish. It's really not a red meat story is it it's not really because people care about individuals health it's really not about cancer and protein it's about whatever behind the agenda is they don't want people eating animals probably something but it's not because they're caring about our health first yes and i i think i should clarify when i was saying mTOR is going to be kind of propagated when we're in that younger stage. I think, and I, I would defer to you, of course, on this, is that around that age bracket, you know, late teens, early 20s, folks are probably consuming a higher ratio of protein than when they get older. I don't and know. So, yeah. I but mean, also, but the other part too was yeah. the exercise yeah. that is going to be involved, which tends to decline as folks are getting older, especially right. in our society. So mTOR is going to be more active. And I love, this is the compliment you mentioned, IGF-1 which is just going to be produced more in abundance when we're younger, period. And again, if that was a stimulator, a stimulator and driver of cancer, people would just have cancer all the time. Exactly. And we also have to differentiate what kind of cancers are we talking about. Right. Do you realize that people, people say, oh, protein cancer. What kind of cancer? 
Lung cancer? We haven't gotten better at treating lung cancer in the last 60 years. It's not a metabolic disease. Colon cancer? Well, uh, that's kind of pulling at straws because we know obesity is a risk factor for that. But why are you not focused on that? You Speaking see? of the gastrointestinal tract, period. <laughs> yeah. What about protein as far as our microbiome? You know, this mm -hmm. is where a lot of science is just teeming with innovation and new research. Is there any connections here that you Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see what comes out in the next decade. A uh, recent study just came out that was a proof of concept study in, uh, I think, Nature Communication, which was my mentor was a part of. And it actually showed that for an eight-week period of time that the body, and this, uh, these are, this is a rodent study, can become more like a ruminant microbiome. So it actually generates some essential amino acids, which is a proof of concept as to why some vegan or vegetarian individuals do not seem more, I don't want to say the word, I have, don't have lower muscle mass than we would expect, right? Because if they are very devoid of brown chain amino acids or lower in those essential amino acids, we would anticipate them to be much more muscle deficient, I guess you would say. Some data is coming out that the gut can actually generate essential amino acids from the microbiome. This is fascinating. Same thing with generating glucose mm -hmm. from protein. Yeah, so gluconeogenesis. Well. Yeah. Gluconeogenesis is interesting. When you think about gluconeogenesis, this is this concept that the body can generate its own glucose. One of the reasons why, you know, in my clinic, I see some individuals that eat, or eat a higher protein diet have... Um, higher elevated or higher hemoglobin a1c's but there's a belief possibly that the red blood cells live longer because the body is going through this process of gluconeogenesis for every 100 grams of protein we eat our body generates 60 grams of glucose through gluconeogenesis through its self-generating properties interesting right yeah yeah so i'd much rather get my glucose that way man that is just the, what what I'm really hearing is another another leg under the belief system, which is really this is a, a truism that the human body is incredibly adaptable. It is, and it knows what to do right. to survive. But also, what we're talking about today is what can it what can you do for your body to thrive? Like, what is ideal? What do your what is your DNA really expecting you to provide for? just robust health, immune system, um, wellness, m metabolic health, cardiovascular health. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about here today. And I want to go back to our biggest killer, cardiovascular disease, which the average, you know, from year to year, the last few years oh, has been about 630,000 folks have passed away here in the United States with heart disease being the what's on their death, on their death certificate. In 2020, that jumped up to almost 700,000. And it's as if it didn't happen. Like nobody's mm. blinking an eye about it. But the point I'm making is it's been a consistent major issue of premature death yeah. for our citizens. And what we've been targeting, which we've sucked at it, is the dietary change here to stop heart disease right. is lower your cholesterol, take a statin, and lower your fat. There's over, four, so I was just looking at this today, there's over 200 million people on a statin. I mean, I usually say 40 million people, but I was just looking at this morning. That's a lot to lower cholesterol. People are saying, you know, they threw out that reduced dietary cholesterol, but people are still recommending that. They took that out of the guidelines. They took cholesterol recommendations out of the guidelines. But you didn't see that headline. You sure didn't see that, did you? <laughs> yeah, it's it's so interesting. Again, when we get a narrative, yeah. and then you get products around it, mm -hmm. you get people profiting from it, yep. and not understanding how cholesterol is literally one of the most important nutrients for the human body. And also, the cholesterol in food and the cholesterol in your body are two different things. Absolutely, your body makes 100 milligrams of cholesterol a day. If you're, you know, if it's so bad, why is your body making it? You know, it's just, it's so interesting, you know, but again, 
This is what these conversations. Or I'm sorry, your body needs 100 milligrams a day. Yeah. Whether it, it makes 800 milligrams and you. The brain eat is the just rest. making its yeah. own on demand. Yeah. You know, your brain is most concentrated with cholesterol anywhere. Again, if it's so bad. But, you know, again, logic is kind of pushed to the side. And I, I'm, I'm wanting to know more about protecting us from this major killer, yeah. you know, something that ended my grandfather's no. life. You know, multiple open heart surgeries, hypertension, all these things. His doctor told him lower the fat, eat these, you know, partially hydrogenated oils, you know, watch, definitely stay away from red meat. Right. What could That's my crazy. grandfather have, have done? And he, he was hunt, he used to hunt mm. and he would forage and all these things and all that kind of got taken away from him slowly. Um, number one, I'm hearing, of course, we really have to look at building muscle. You do. And we need to make sure why. So let's talk about why as far as cardiovascular health, muscle, and protein. Yeah. So for cardiovascular health, obviously, there's that training component. The heart is a muscle. There's resistance exercise, aerobic activity, which I think is status quo. Where skeletal muscle really plays a role is that it allows for regulation of body composition. It really can reduce visceral body fat, you know, as you're utilizing skeletal muscle, it allows for glucose regulation. Fatty acid oxidation occurs in skeletal muscle. And for survival, say someone does have a cardiac event, the way in which they're going to survive, the more muscle mass they have, the better their survivability. That's proven. Which is, yeah, which is really interesting. You know, there is something to be said for good cardiovascular screening. If an individual is has familial hypercholesterolemia, definitely should be examined. And, you know, we do more advanced lipid testing. Calcium score, the clear, it's called a, a new scan called a clearly scan. Those kinds of things, which will allow for early detection. And calorie control. And also... If you care about triglycerides, you have to reduce carbohydrates. It's not a red meat issue. It could be a total calorie issue, but it's not a red meat issue. The next question you would have to say, well, what's the mechanism of action? If they told your grandfather to stop eating red meat because it's bad for his cholesterol, well, what's the mechanism of action? Why? They've proven that dietary cholesterol has very minimal impact on blood cholesterol of course, if you are a lean mass hyperresponder or there's you know other components to that, but the majority of the population doesn't really need to be focused on cholesterol. In fact, like I said, they took that out of the guidelines. Yeah. You know, I was very young when this happened. And again, he was just far too young. And How old was he? He was, I believe he was 59 or oh. 60. And... I remember again, like it was started off as high blood pressure and he invoked these changes primarily because of the pushing of my grandmother. <laughs> and, um, you know, from there, you know, he did the things and it got worse, you know, instead of better. And this can be like if somebody can omit the power of food here, but that would be the biggest mistake because our tissues are literally made from these things. Yeah. You know, like we get to decide how what our cells are made of and also how they're communicating and you know that was uh one of those moments again that just added to my armor that i wear today in defense of everybody you know and so and i want to thank you for that too because again the the issue today that's on a lot of people's minds these very simple tenants are so overlooked yeah. and i want to ask you about this as well the role that protein and again like it, it, it even as i'm saying it talking to you <laughs> it seems so such a it seems like it doesn't the word doesn't express how important it is but in regards to immune system function like yeah. our immune cells are made of proteins mm -hmm. let's talk about that yeah i mean protein dietary protein and just protein in the body is what everything is built on you know and there again and even if you think about uh, branched chain amino acids they fuel cell, our immune cells and they are there's a crosstalk between skeletal muscle and immune function macrophages 
these interleukins that are released. We have to, if you really care about immune health, you do need to care about training. You do need to care about your diet. You do need to care about wellness for sure. Wow. It's, of course, it's not getting much attention, but um, you know, I appreciate you talking about that. And this is a good spot to reiterate the quality of protein. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier, you know, just giving a, an example of, you know, whether it's um, a chicken breast or a red meat example, yeah. but let's compare that to a vegetarian source because again, this is inclusive, but we also need to look at logic here. Yeah. Like how much quinoa would you need or how it's much about six peanut cups. butter? It's about six cups of quinoa to one small chicken breast. That's a lot of quinoa. <laughs> That's, That's a, a lot. lot of quinoa. Probably the best of both worlds would be to utilize both. Hmm. It doesn't have to be where you're eating all meat and it doesn't have to be where you're eating all vegetables. There can be a combination of the two. And when you think about high quality protein, you do think about animal sources. It's just the way that it is. And it's kind of like saying that the sky is blue. This is from the amino acid profile that exists. These are hard, fast scientific numbers. We do need a certain amount of amino acids, essential amino acids to stimulate muscle. Um, those amino acids go on and do a multiple, you know, they do multiple other things, right? You, if you care about gut health, you care about threonine, which helps make mucin. You care about serotonin production. There's all sorts of reasons why we need dietary protein above and beyond skeletal muscle health. But if we don't do the foundation, then the rest all kind of falls away. And also, I think, in addition, I, we need to talk about the actual protein fraction of these things too, you know, like it might be the beans and rice combination right. to get these, what what's assumed to be <laughs> a complete protein. It's a and, lot of carbs. Yeah. I mean, if you care about obesity, you care about Alzheimer's, you care about heart disease, we have to not over consume. When you're younger, you can get away with eating beans and rice. It's fine. But as we age, we have to understand that protein is a nutrient signal. It is a cellular signaling mechanism for mTOR. We have to make sure. So if you're eating sub threshold, let's say you're in your 40s and you decide you're going to have 20 grams of protein. And that's how you're going to do it. And you're going to get it from rice and beans. You're never going to stimulate your tissue. Your skeletal muscle will not be stimulated on that. It's not adequate. It is a on or off mechanism. It either is going to stimulate these processes or it's not. Mm -hmm. As we age, it becomes much more important to pay attention. When I think about some of my favorite sources of high quality protein, I do. I think about beef or bison or chicken or turkey. Even fish is okay. Eggs, whey. If you're vegan or vegetarian, it's going to take, it could take, you know, 35% more. Could take six cups of quinoa. You know, it's interesting. Protein is really underrepresented. Next time you look at your, if you eat anything out of a package, which you might not, but if you look at a protein bar or if you look at, say, hemp protein, it'll just say protein. Whereas you look at, I don't know, a fat label it'll have a breakdown of fat if you look at a carbohydrate label it'll have a breakdown of carbohydrates and then you just look at protein mm -hmm. but the reality is protein is made up of 20 amino acids and for example if you have 20 grams of hemp protein your the biological the bioavailability that might be 10 grams but because the amino acid profile is not there you have no idea right. we have no idea the quality of that protein Let's talk about that <laughs> because I'm wondering about protein supplements because that can be, here's the thing. And again, I really hope folks get this, especially if the goal is weight loss. If you take on what Dr. Lyon is sharing today, try and targeting it. Try it. You, the, your ideal body weight mm -hmm. in grams of protein, yeah. it's it can be challenging to get that protein in because it's so satiating uh -huh. in some aspects and so i want to talk about protein supplement mm -hmm. right so whey is the mo most studied yep like well, i'll just throw a ballpark ballpark figures probably 90 to 95 percent of studies on 
protein supplementation is whey. And whey is an amazing food matrix. It has alpha-lactalbumin. When you care about the immune system, you have to care about whey protein. It has alpha-lactalbumin, lactoferrin. It has these food matrices within them, these substances that are very helpful for the, for the immune system. Yeah. And then there, of course, there are some studies now with pea protein and the like. Um, Which are relatively new to the human body. Right. These pea isolates. You got to consider that. You do. And also, there's a lot of talk about estrogen components in pea and soy, which is much higher than you would find in an egg, mm -hmm. for example. And there's egg protein, but it's probably, you'd probably recommend folks to just eat the egg. I would recommend. <laughs> and then there's collagen protein, yeah. which is incomplete protein and weighs around, you know, weighs around a plant-based protein, a pea or rice is if it's in combination, because mm -hmm. you're really looking for that amino acid profile. You could utilize a scoop of essential amino acids. You could use a scoop of branch chain amino acids to really make it workable for um, someone who doesn't want to eat any kind of animal products. Got it. So if we're doing the pea protein mm -hmm. or pea rice combination yep. protein, adding in some BCAAs yeah. as great. well. Okay, got it. But the BCAAs in and of themselves, that isn't going to stimulate protein synthesis. It will, but it's like sitting in a car and turning on the key. It won't actually go. Mm. Branched chain amino acids by themselves will actually stimulate mTOR, but it won't be enough to lay down. You require all the amino acids to lay down muscle. There we go. So the full Monty. It's not, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And, and there's actually a great paper uh, Robert Wolf wrote on this. Mm. Uh, I can send it to you. It's great. Awesome. Yeah, this is fascinating. And so um, we've got, you mentioned collagen, mm -hmm. but let's clarify this because collagen is hot right now. And it I is think hot. for good reason, there's a lot of benefits seen yeah. here. But you're saying that this is not the complete protein we're looking for as well. Not for muscle health. Mm -hmm. It's very low in brown chains and it's devoid of tryptophan. Not to say it's not good, but it's not something for muscle health. Okay. So we're not going to be stimulating what we're looking for here with muscle, mu muscle mm -hmm. development. Right. But what are some other potential benefits here that... Again, I don't want to, because I know a lot of folks are probably utilizing collagen. It's great collagen. for your gut. I mean, I use it. Use mm -hmm. it for your gut. You can use it in addition to other protein sources, mm -hmm. skin, hair, nails. I, and to be 100, I haven't really talked about collagen on the show very often, mm -hmm. maybe a couple of times in all these years. But I do know, of course, like I see the trends as well. And uh, what about as far as... The glycine, for example, what yes, about that? Yes, I actually was thinking about that. That's one way. So glycine is an amino acid. It's Glycine can actually help reduce methionine. There may be some evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not totally sure yet, but it, it may be helpful in methionine restriction, which is methionine restriction is this idea of why fasting can be beneficial. One reason why fasting can be beneficial. You know, I try not to talk in absolutes, but yes, it does have a lot of glycine. And that can be helpful, can also help you sleep, can lower anxiety, those kinds of things. Awesome. Well, I want to switch gears because I heard you say something along the lines of modern medicine's focus on pathology yeah. is sort of like chasing your own tail. Mm -hmm. Why did you say that? It's a mistake. We, it's, we are trying, it's as if we are constantly focusing on this problem and we believe that problem to be the, the source, but it's not. If we were gonna fix the obesity epidemic, we're smarter than we've ever been. We have more technology than we ever have. And we're fatter than we've ever been in our, we're fatter and more unhealthy than we've ever been. It's, we're chasing our tail. We're looking, we're trying to answer the wrong question. We, this is not an issue about being over fat. This is truly an issue about being under muscled. And if we keep looking in this paradigm, we are going to constantly be chasing our tail. It's not going to get better. I guarantee you in another 10 years, it's going to look exactly the same. Actually, with, with higher populations, it's going to look worse. Then throw on the narrative, this anti-protein narrative, people are not going to have a chance. So I personally don't like chasing my own tail. <laughs> and know. it's not to offend people. You know, I don't want to say, 
you know, I'm not. I'm I was not thinking fat. about somebody actually with the tailbone, with, <laughs> the, with the long coccyx yeah, yeah. out here chasing I, it around. And, I, you know? and I'm not, this is not about fat shaming. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with individuals who are struggling with their weight. What I am really trying to advocate is I believe that people deserve answers. And I believe in order for people to change, they have to have the right information. And with information overload, people don't have a chance. And that's what I'm really trying to shift. And this is not complicated. This isn't like for that weight loss this is access. Not complicated there's stuff. no, you know, there's no, you don't have to buy some this special is, you don't have lion to do, no, you signed don't. off supplement you or, you know, you don't have to, you just eat real food and you take a shift in your thinking about that food. Yep. And you figure out how to dose it appropriately. Yeah. You don't need less protein as you age. You need more. You need to make sure that you're consuming protein in discrete meals, which is going to be much bigger than most people realize and they're not used to. They really need to work on stimulating their tissue. They really need to be consistent. You know, the standard American eating pattern is have a big steak dinner. You don't want to do that. You want to start the day with protein. You want to prioritize protein. If you eat carbohydrates, you want to make sure that you keep it under 30 to 40 grams easily, you know, because you don't want to stimulate. You don't want to have a more robust insulin response. And you end your day with a protein meal. The meal in between, I don't care. Shouldn't be straight carbohydrates, but whether your protein meal hits 30 grams or not, I'm okay with because you've already stimulated your tissue first thing in the morning and you stimulate it again before you go to sleep. Sounds pretty <laughs> simple. Yeah. Uh, this has been so fascinating. And you already mentioned this earlier that this is really your life's work. This is why you're here, your purpose. Yeah. And if you could, can you share a little bit more about what is the model that you're hoping to create yeah. for everyone? I am really hoping to create a new form of medicine where it is focused on skeletal muscle. And it's not, what this is, is it's looking at skeletal muscle as an endpoint for health. It's looking at biomarkers that directly are related to skeletal muscle. It's about looking at post-exercise endpoints not VO2 max, not just body composition, but also these myokines and these other markers. It's also looking at actually looking at skeletal muscle tissue. It's also looking at is the skeletal muscle tissue being, um, you know, how is the blood flow to skeletal muscle tissue? It's actually treating skeletal muscle as the organ that it is. Mm. It's an endocrine organ and it should be treated like that. So we should measure it like that. We should image it like that. And we should have physicians that specialize in it. This just makes too much sense, you know. Yeah. And so thank you so much yeah. for sharing your wisdom and your insights. I mean, I'm still bubbling over. I want to talk about muscle. There's it's so much being, to talk about. Being it's... an endocrine organ related to it, the thyroid, yeah. its impact on the thyroid, the impact on the adrenal glands, just, ah. <laughs> so I would love to have you back, of course, yeah. whenever we get the chance. I would love and, to. you know, you're, you're amazing. Thank you so much for being a voice and for being somebody who's really leading the charge in this. And if you could, can you let everybody know where they can follow you, uh -huh. get a, inf more information, yeah, sure. just get more into your work. Yep, and also I will have a book coming out on all this stuff, but Thank just goodness. it needs awesome. a little bit of time. And um, But you can find me on my website, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. You can find me on Instagram, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. YouTube, you can see conversations with my mentor. I thought it was really, you know, he's older. I hope he doesn't ever listen to my stuff. And I wanted to be able to share these conversations that I've had for two decades. Mm -hmm. So we record and we talk about all this stuff. And they can find that on my YouTube. I have a newsletter, which I curate myself. And it's some of this just interesting studies and learning resources, that kind of a thing. And if people are interested in being a patient, they can apply. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. What can people do? to control their stress because I think a lot of people just feel like stress is like getting thrown into the current of life and you just have to wait until the current slows down and that's absolutely not the case. There are things that we can all do that don't involve ingesting anything. 